just like Apollo Creed and so and, uh, and, and Rocky. And, and, yeah. No. Oh no, that was uh, it was uh, Predator. A yeah, predator? with Carl Weathers and Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, remember they're in the jungle. They're like. I don't you know, know that, about that. You didn't I know see that about movie? Rocky and Apollo Creed when they ran on the beach afterwards. Oh, yeah, that's true. And then they do the high five. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right? All right. I feel like that's a better. Okay, we'll life. do that. But it's still the same cool character, just like you, bro. Absolutely cool. My man Ken that. here from Free Hunts Project. And we got Sheriff Chris Watson from Let's Walk and also from, I mean, Flint. We're in like that's Michigan, it. everything yep. that's going on here. Yeah. So, okay. Um, the pilot episode. The pilot episode. So for those of you that are watching this, well, this would be the first time that we're ever checking in. Now, we have some episodes that are coming with this, but this is the Black and Blue podcast. And and the reason why we're doing this is that we think it's really important that we have discussions between um, people of color, the black community, and law enforcement as an agency. So that's the reason why Black and Blue, for those of you that are wondering what's the uh, whole purpose behind the show. But this is the pilot episode. So... Um, We'll be touching on some serious subjects along the way, but know that we were always going to come from a place of compassion, a that's place right. that's going to unify people. There's so much division in the country right now, and we feel like it's our job, especially as two men with, with big hearts, right, that just mm-hmm. care about people, that I think that us having these topics, that it's important for us to uh, cover them. Plus, you have a slogan, right? There's a slogan that you... Uh, you had what I always forget oh, yeah. what it is. East meets west. Yep. Black meets, meets white. white. Yep. And everything is on the table. Everything's on the table. So we're talking about everything. And let me tell you on everything because we've done a couple shows to just send out to people to really get their critique. And uh, one's my Jamie girl back there who's like my barometer <laughs> of success. Yeah. And uh, I and another buddy. And I thought it was interesting because based on that tagline, what they liked about what they saw was our chemistry. Number yes. one, the fact that you come with an authority from your circle of influence and I come with authority of mine, but together we do it in a way that takes uncomfortable topics and makes some conversations. Totally. And we answer things that would make people feel stupid if they ask that question. So they just get the information from sources that have no no influence yeah, or no yeah. credibility. And that's yeah. where we come in. Black yeah. and blue. There we go. Cool. What a great show. <laughs> I give him the credit for coming up with that name, no black and blue. Yeah. So I, I mean, honestly. Awesome. And I know we talked about this later, but it was at church. And he's like, dude, we should do a podcast. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, black and blue. I'm like, that's the show. <laughs> yeah. So nobody yeah. in the country is doing this. Right. No, it, 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 like... There's been things like that. I think there's been movies and all that, but it always comes from one side, right? It's never both sides coming from um, their own life experiences and saying, let's put this on the table and and let's talk about it. That's right. And so for the topic today that we're going to cover in our pilot episode. Get ready for it. um, And and it's heavy stuff because it's everything Mm -hmm. that's been going on in Wisconsin. And we know that people are going to have two completely different takes on it, right? And so, and I'm sure even some of the things that we'll discuss today, uh, we just want to preface anyone that that is watching this before you pass judgment on what our our thoughts are, we're going to try and lead from the heart with as everything that we cover with this discussion. And so if there's anything where you're like, oh, I don't really like what they're talking about. Well, you know, Let's get past that. Keep watching. Keep watching it, right? Because there's always, yeah. at the end, something that is intended to unify and yeah. bring people together. And we don't want people to agree with everything we say, it can't but happen. we want people to be open to, I didn't understand a perspective, or that's inter- interesting, I didn't know that. Yes. So, yeah. you were on the front lines at Kenosha. I was there. Dude. Yes. You know what was interesting, too? So, um, I, I like my mom called me and she's like, Hey, did you just walk by the camera on oh, CNN wow. <laughs> in Wisconsin? And so I watched the news that night. And, sure and I did. Yeah. That's and you so see me cool. walk by with the free hug shirt on. Um, so I was like, for real, for real there. Went to the protest earlier. Side in note, the day. free hugs project. Yes. This is what you do. You go to this protests. Yes. Yes. And you try to unify yes. people there regardless of what side they're on. Completely. Right, yeah. So on. like when I show up there, I always feel like my purpose in being there is to de-escalate mm. tension that exists there. And and we're going to get into some of it. Like, maybe that should be the second portion of this. I think let's start with what caused the whole thing. Obviously, the shooting of Jacob Blake, right? Okay. Everyone is wondering, how do we get to a point where someone has seven shots fired into his back as he's entering his vehicle. Now, for me, when I first watched it, I put out a video right away where I said, look, I don't want to rush to judgment on this thing. We cannot 
rush to judgment from a 17 second clip. There's obviously so many other factors mm -hmm. that went into that. What was the police call um, or the uh, call that they received from dispatch to even get there? So there's a lot that that transpired why I said, I don't want to pass judgment on this thing. But when I first saw it, my heart was heavy. Mm. And I was like, this, this is tough. We're just coming off just. of the George Floyd thing, right? And I remember the first time I asked you what your thoughts were on the George Floyd thing, and you felt like, here we go again, that just like puts a target yep. on our back, right? Yep. And and I feel like this does that Without all over doubt. again, right? Just weeks later. Um, do, when you first watched that video, was that the first thing that was going through your mind again, or, or were you same thing, kind of like, what is this? Because it happened so fast, right? Yeah. You could be scrolling across your yeah. social media and there's no warning. Just all of a sudden, a few seconds later, bam, Boom. bam, 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 right? So. First question is, it sounds sad, but I now ask in any kind of shooting, is there white and black involved? Mm. That's sad that, that sad. we even have to ask that, right? Why do we not see black officers in controversial white shootings? Yeah. So that's the first thing is, what is the race? And literally, when I see white on white shootings or black on black police shootings, yeah. I can take a breath. Wow. But when I see white cops in a black shooting, I'm like, oh, gosh, please. And the second thing is shot in the back. Yeah. That is the worst place to put your rounds. And you better have a good reason to wow. shoot somebody in the back. So those two things, when I saw, I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Wow. And so, and, and for those that are watching, just know that, like, Chris is for real a sheriff, right? So this isn't just yeah. a man who is giving his opinion or, yep. or his thoughts. And yet even still as a sheriff, it's it's unfortunate that you have to ask, wait, first, what yeah. was the race of everyone involved, right? Yeah. Or the ethnicity of everyone yeah. involved. And and that's that's really unfortunate. And I would imagine that the reason why you feel that way is because as we're seeing those videos continue to go viral, yeah. it's just furthering the divide. Furthering divide, and it changes the way I respond. Yeah, it, There's a different dynamic. It'd be no different if there was a shooting that was in a mosque yeah. versus a shooting that was in a school. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes the way you respond, but you're right. In this case, as a white police sheriff executive, when that happens, the first thing I, I think of is, what would I do in that situation? Yeah. If I was that chief or that sheriff, and uh, you know, not everybody's gonna make the right call, but I certainly, from an outsider's point of view, saw some things I'd have done much different. Yeah, what are some of those things? Get out in front of it ASAP. Immediately, right? Im immediate. Tell me this, do you know of anything that disputes the fact that that police department took 72 hours to come out with the first public statement? Wow. No, I'm asking, did you hear, no, no. did they come I, out anytime anything, sooner than that? I heard, like, I forget which officer it was, but the press was asking him, had he had, had he seen the video yet? And he says right there to the press, no, I haven't watched it yet. And I was like, but he's like a lead oh officer. He was either the chief or the sheriff or some. Did you see that? Like he was saying he hadn't watched the video. Let me just say, I can only speak for Chris, okay? I'm the sheriff of Genesee County in Flint, Michigan, a large city, and you have to have, we always talk about having your you know, your community connections, but if that happens, like we've done on everything, the first thing people wanna see is, was there video? Right. And the first thing I wanna see is, I wanna see the video. Whether it's a jail incident, an in-car camera, I don't care, I wanna see video. Like, yeah. the, the video doesn't lie. Yeah. So when I saw that they took that long to come forward, that's the first thing is like, if you don't create your own narrative of this is what we know, this is what we don't know, I'll come back to you in an hour. Yes. People are gonna fill in the blanks mm -hmm. and people get frustrated. You know, we always have a saying in our office to be unclear is to be unkind. Like if I ask you a question yeah. and you come to me and it's an important question mm -hmm. and you come to me and say, Chris, I'm gonna tell you in two days. I'd be like, what? Yeah. What are you talking about? I don't wanna wait two days. The second thing is, you should have had somebody from that community right there next to you. If I'm involved with somebody that uh, the victim or the incident involves a Muslim yeah. individual, I'm gonna have a Muslim representative there. I'm gonna have an LGBTQ, I'm gonna have a white person, I'm gonna have a cop. Somebody that can say, okay, I don't understand that perspective. Yeah. Help me, what's the best way to message wow. this? That's just smart leadership Absolutely. because I don't know what people's perception is. So in that case, those are the two things that stood out to me is why didn't they get on it the first hour? Yes. In fact, we just had a conversation with James Craig 
from Detroit Police Department, mm -hmm. and he had a controversial shooting just right after the George Floyd shooting. Yeah. And and everybody was saying on the street that that those officers shot and killed that guy. But what happened was that guy shot into the police officers and they had video of it. But the story got out faster on social media than he could even get to the scene. Wow. As soon as Chief Craig got to the scene, he's like, listen, everybody, let me tell you what's happening. I don't know all the answers. This is what I know, and I'll see you. And then he released the video. Never heard of it. Done. So the first thing is get out in front of it yeah. and have somebody from that community right there next to you and say, what am I missing? Yes. What do I need to do? Yeah. Wow. That's Just powerful. like this. Yes. This is this is you having somebody from my community. To and, have this and, conversation yes, with. Yes, exactly. And, and that was what I said in my video, too. When I, when I first saw it, I said, I don't want to rush to judgment, but I have friends in law enforcement that I can't wait to have this discussion oh. with. And, and some people really understood that. And some people still felt like, well, why are you even rushing to judgment by even making this video? I'm like, because my heart is heavy. Yeah. Like, I, I need to say something. I, I need to vent this. This is my outlet. This platform has become my outlet. And even still, people yeah. felt like I was passing judgment simply by saying, I've got to talk to some officer friends of mine yes. about this thing. And, and I hope that more people, sometimes when we see these things, mm -hmm. will wait. Like, let's just wait yeah. a little bit and, yeah. and see what other information comes out. Because yeah. when we don't wait, what happens is it leads to the riots that we yeah. saw just days later after it. You know, my dream is, even though this is pilot, I would love to build credibility with our listeners that they literally think, I want to find out what Ken says. Yes. I want to talk to the sheriff. Totally. Because we're going to give you what we know from an objective point of view, from a heart person point of Absolutely. view, that, that most people don't get in a 30-second soundbite. That's what my hope is. So then I'm going to ask you a question. We will. Eventually, yeah, yeah. I know that, that, that with your credibility and mine already, and now mix it up together, it's yeah. just going to be a power-packed uh, in you know uh, connection, yeah. but when when you got on scene, mm -hmm. so to speak, how soon after the shooting did you arrive? Um, two days. Well, so I got there the day after the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So by then, um, those crews had already cleared out, and so what I saw. What does that mean? <clears> those <throat> crews. Um, the the protesters who became rioters by that night, but then also the groups that showed up with Kyle. So the two opposing sides, Got it. I did not see them. What either I saw, side. No, either side. What I saw were the peaceful protesters in the daytime. I saw the father. Got um, it. You know, okay. I stood there as, as yes. he spoke. Um, I think it was uh, Jacob Blake's sister yep. spoke that day. So a very uh, peaceful protest in, now, in the Now where did those two groups go? Did they just come out working second shift or what? <laughs> so they didn't come out that night that's mm. for sure um but but yeah so that's what's interesting right like those are the people who show up immediately and they caused the destruction on, on both sides that's and we'll right get into that why i feel like that was destruction on both sides when really what should have happened was when that protest happened the rally of the community. And when I showed up there, I'm telling you, it was black, white, old, young. There's people pushing babies in, in strollers, you know, as yeah. they are chanting for justice and yeah. listening to the speeches of everyone. You know, th there was no issues. Nobody was throwing anything at the police or the National Guard the way or anything. The it's supposed to be, The way it's man. supposed to be, right? The, the, um, a lot of the buildings were boarded up and we just started painting positive art on, on all of them. So all the boards that were there, just Martin so Luther King So there was like, uh, there was, preemptive boards put up so their houses and oh, stores. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because like, they expected something to go down. Down that entire strip actually. So all the streets that were supposed to be part of the protest yeah. everything was boarded up. And so I loved how people from the community yeah. said let's turn this tragedy oh into my positive gosh. art. And so the video that I released um, when, I, when I arrived there was actually a video of all of the art that was on the board. So they recognize you when you showed up with your shirt? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. That's so so awesome. yeah, the community was like, I can't believe the free hugs guy is here. And the interactions that I got to have with people, one of my favorites, it was a pastor of a church who had just um, finished giving a sermon. And then he saw me and he flipped his car back around and he came over and he, and he talked with me. And then he said- White pastor, black pastor? White pastor, maybe Latino. Um, but I but I think he was white. And he yeah. was like, can you address my congregation what? on live? And just hands me his phone oh. live and like, I'm preaching to his church. Yes. <laughs> I loved it. So yeah, so that was that was really cool. But again, 
that's how a community heals, right? Yeah. And so, so the experience that I saw when I arrived there was here is a community that is trying to heal, but outside agitators come in and affect that healing process. You're just taking off the band-aids when you have people who now, because of what happened, they're greeting their neighbors more. They're asking people if they need anything. Oh my I'm walking gosh. by the number of people that offered me water, cookies, chips, not just because I'm the free hugs guy, but yeah. because they had it out there. Yeah. The restaurants that were open that are like, we're just serving the community yes. there's no charge today like they want to heal they want to bring people together but when you turn on the news or you go on the social media comment feeds that's not what you're seeing about what uh, everything that's oh going my on gosh. right and so so that part bothered me the most because the experience on the ground is not the experience of what you see back at home on social so, media so let me just say this for those that are watching kenosha is like like they're Chicago mm -hmm. and Kenosha is right up the coastline on Lake Erie. Correct. And so from Chicago to Kenosha, what do you think? How long is the drive? An hour. Okay, an hour. Yep. So of the percentage of people that you saw that are passing out cookies and water versus what the media shows or what we perceive as just total buck wild chaos, yes. what's the percentage of which? I saw none of that when I when I arrived there. I and you were there for how long? Uh, what, the whole weekend. So like, Come on, what, three, even four at days? night? At night, no, there was, I, I was driving around taking pictures of signs at night. But again, Dude. I got there the day after the, the, the Kyle Rittenhouse So was it shooting. over after you got there? I'm guessing the, the, the bad part of it was over. But, but was even now, protests. you would think by watching it now, it's still on, there's still garbage trucks on fire, but that was. That's all old stuff. That's Come crazy. On. You've got, you've got. National Guard, police, everybody are probably clearing out of there. But yes, the media still kind of hypes it up yeah. like it's uh, this chaotic scene about to combust. So the agitators not. that came in to create pain yes. on a community that's trying to heal, when did that start and what do you think caused them to leave? I think that started the night that the shooting hit social media. And I think what caused everyone to leave was, oh snap, people really got shot tonight. And, and that part is what really woke me up to it as well. I saw, I saw the seven shots. I made that first video. And then the, the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting. So here's, here's what really affects me on the, on the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting. Now, these are two separate instances in two my com book. Com completely. And, yeah. and, I, and I think we'll backtrack to the Jacob Blake part. Got but it. I, I think there's, there's some serious things that I think should be covered on, on the Kyle Rittenhouse part. Because even on, so here's here's what frustrated me. On the video that I put out where I was taking um, video clips of all of the positive signs and messages. At the end of that video, I put this video is dedicated to um, to the skateboarder or the fearless skateboarder who attempted to stop the shooter and and lost his life. Right. Yeah. Boom. Comments start coming in on my YouTube video from people saying I used to like you, Ken, but now I don't like you anymore or I'm going to unsubscribe or unfollow your channel because of the dedication that you gave at the end of that video. <laughs> I'm like, wait, hold up. So <laughs> because I am honoring a lost life. And, and my issue with that is we have become so desensitized as a nation that people are so quick to find the flaws of even the person who lost their life and they'll worship the shooter and just completely disregard and tarnish and trash the, the, the lost life. life. Right. And so because we've become so desensitized, I I'm scared of uh, to know that that's where we are as a nation that I can't even leave a dedication for someone who is now gone right because that we know nothing about we don't know anything don't about know his background him. nothing right and so and and sometimes the media will try and pull whatever they can find to uh, um, tarnish this person's reputation like I mean and I saw it in the comments people are like how dare you put that dedication that guy was a scumbag or that guy like, they don't even know this guy you don't know anything about him right or he shouldn't have tried to hit Kyle with the skateboard and I was like wait hold up what he heard was this man just shot someone or this boy just shot someone yeah. most of us in our instinct would try and stop that person from That's getting right. away and when people are saying yeah you, you would have stopped him from trying to run to the uh, police to turn himself in and i was like but you don't know that in that moment no he just shot someone and he's running in in this direction most so even for me um in our last episode when i talked about when i was in charlottesville and james fields ran over yeah, the right. 18 uh, or 19 people yeah. if i were armed that day 
which I don't go to these protests armed, but if I was, I would imagine my first instinct would be eliminate the threat. 100%. Right? He's just run over 19 That's people. Right. So most of us would think that way. And yeah. so this guy who, with his skateboard, attempts to do that, just for me leaving this dedication, people are like, forget you, Ken. You're not like who I, who I thought you were or yeah. you're becoming political. I'm like, how is like honoring a lost life political? Because I always try and backtrack and say at some point that was a mother's baby. And that, that okay. really affects so I, me. So I don't forget mental footnote on the term eliminate the threat. We're yes. going to come back to that. So okay. we can't. So crew, don't let me forget eliminate the threat. Okay. The second thing is, do you feel like people did that to you or wrote those comments because that lost life was not on their side? Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Yes. A thousand percent. It's because that lost life was not on their side. And it's unfortunate that people are having to choose sides in that way. Because I did see in the comments also when they're like, Kyle was there to take out the trash. And it's sad that they're saying that. They're saying the BLM trash, the Antifa trash, he should be hailed as a hero. And I'm like, wait, let's pause for a second. You have police, you have um, National Guard, probably federal agents, so many different groups out there, trained law enforcement groups that are out there, trained to do their job. When you have people like Tucker Carlson saying, this 17 year old boy stepped in to do the job because no one else would, I actually took that as a jab on you all as law enforcement from him saying, They're not doing their job. So a 17-year-old kid, that's where we are as a nation, that we're appointing a 17-year-old kid to step up and do the job of Mm -hmm. of trained officers, right? So, So when I'm looking at it, and I'm like, here you have a kid who was trembling in his boots even being out there. And obviously, and anyone who tries to dispute that. Because you saw the interview before the shooting, right? I saw was the this, interview. Was, yeah. My name is Kyle, and he had his med kit, and he's got his Air here's 15 what I'm, there. Here's my job. Right. I'm, I'm here yeah. to make sure if, if, if anything goes down, I'm running into harm's way. Yeah, yeah but people who are trained to do that mm-hmm. are not running in there trigger happy. I'm, I show up to those things to do the exact same thing. And there's video footage of me being there, being shoved by people, having things thrown at me, having people curse at me. Guess what? I'm not armed and my words are what de-escalate Thank the you. situation. Yep. Not waving an AR-15 in someone's face. How did That cannot de-escalate the situation. And so when people are using the excuse that, well, someone threw a Molotov cocktail at him, so so, so that's why I'm like, I've been, I've had things thrown at me as well. And even still, I got that situation to, to, to tone down just by talking to the very people who threw something at me. And so by not showing up with a weapon, I'm automatically not seen as someone that they need to confront because I'm just here in a t-shirt, man. And I've had to have that conversation. There was a guy who shoved me in Washington, DC. And I'm like, look, man, I'm just trying to make sure that everyone makes it home safely tonight. That would have been a completely different conversation if that was Kyle's stance or Kyle's approach. But instead, when people are using the, the um, it was self-defense, right? So my issue with that is if you were already afraid, you shouldn't be there. There's a saying in our, in our community and you hear in, in our music uh, uh, where they say, if you're scared, go to church, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Don't show up there at 11 p.m. Yeah. on the front lines of this chaotic scene as a 17-year-old boy. When I was 17 years old, I was a senior in high school. If you told me to go and confront 36 year old men yep. who were angry yep. about something yep. I would say are you kidding me I don't care how fast I am as a track athlete where I'm not going to be That's right. is there at 11 or 12 the level o'clock. of maturity the level of experience didn't exist and let me tell you the other thing too this is how broken the system is to to get a pistol and to carry it in public concealed, you yes. have to go through a concealed weapons class. You have to have a legal section. You have to know when to use deadly force, the force continuum. But people can walk in with an Air 15. And if that was in a school parking lot, yeah. what, what would the response be? Exactly. So now you have all these individuals that, and this is the danger because we've worked with them in our community. And, and I think they're patriots like everybody else. Yeah. They, I, obviously, I'm a 2A guy. Yep. I have weapons. There's a gun right over Likewise. there. That I, I love that. But when you talk about using that to supplant the job of law enforcement, who's a constitutional office, 
that is trained and expected yes. to respond in a professional manner to maintain law and order, and that is taken over by somebody you just described. I mean, I think back when I was 17, I mean, I wasn't even mentally prepared to be no thrust way. into that. No way. I, it'd be much better, because I'm sure he's with a group to say, hey, listen, man, you're going to be our medic. You just respond if somebody's That's hurt. That's it. That's it. Because your level of ability isn't even, I mean, we don't hire cops until they're 21 years old many times. 18 yeah. is the minimum. Sorry. Yeah. No, no I, I think that's, that's. And, and you know, one more thing. I'm sorry, bro. No, I'm sorry. Ahead. What I saw was, is, is they, they got empowered because nobody addressed that group first to say, fellas, ladies, I'm glad you're here. But I want you to know when it comes to any situations when it, if for, that are law enforcement related, that's where we come in. Yes. That's where we, I appreciate you being here, but that's where we come in. You have to respond based on what you feel is a threat to your life or someone else's. That's it. Yes. We are the police. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I, I think that when uh, it's, it's so, it's such a touchy subject because you have him even on video saying, I'm here to protect this property, right? And then it makes me question, who even appointed you to protect that property? This property that is boarded up, right? And and if you're concerned about it being even burned down, there's insurance on those businesses for that. There is not insurance on lost lives. And now there's lost lives. And I think that's what hurts me so much as as a man, as as a father, you know, for us, we know that the greatest joy is when we bring a child into the world. And at some point, these two young men who lost their lives there are, are someone's child. And, and it's just really heartbreaking to me to know that as a society, people are just like, well, they, they shouldn't have tried to attack him or they shouldn't have tried to, or they shouldn't have even have been there, right? And, and I'm like, but they're, they're dead now. You know, and we just throw that away. Like, big deal. They shouldn't have done anything. Well, how about this? How about a 17 year old kid now who's locked up and charged with homicide? Yeah. How scared is he right now? Oh, without a doubt. You, you talk about two that lost her life, but he lost his life too. Completely. Regardless of what the outcome was, his life will never be the same. Absolutely. I mean, I think of my boy, and if he was charged, I, I see 17 year olds in jail that are charged with murder. They're terrified, man. Of course. In, in, in and I think back now, you just said, by the time you got there, everything was gone. I'm like, for what? Yeah. What did all this happen for? Exactly. And now there's people who are gone b because of that. And and I think that's the part that, that hurts me the most. And I know that a lot of the people, because now when we talk about sides and, and there's that division that exists there, and it's unfortunate that that even exists, right? But I know that a lot of the people that are supporting Kyle, um, many of them, it's it's conservative groups, right? And I would hope that as those conservative groups, the reason why they are conservative is because they're holding on to their faith, right? And obviously that faith would come from their faith in Christ or whatever their religious views are. But even if that is the case, how do we somehow just disregard that message of Christ of turning the other cheek, right? And instead it becomes they're out there shooting people and killing people, right? So, because what I've heard is that this Molotov cocktail that was thrown in his direction didn't even hit him before he shot the guy in the head, right? And whether it did or didn't, again, it, it's like there's always that, what's that meme where they say, but did you die, right? right. Like, you, did it really hurt right. you that much or could you have de-escalated that situation and left? Did he have, where's all the guys that he was there with in the beginning of that that interview? None of them could stand up just as, as like this barrier of protection that, hey, this isn't okay how did he just get kind of cornered off by on his own to have even shot the guy hops on the phone says i just killed someone and then is running off gets attacked and then shoots people along the way i have so many questions with that thing and it just i guess what it all boils down to for me is when everyone is choosing sides i think what we all need to remember is that no one should have been there that night. Like mm. nobody should have been there. And and that's how Because the community from that community was taking care of it itself. Was already taking care of it. Let those folks take James Craig said the same thing. All of our agitators come from the outside. Completely. Let Detroiters be Detroiters. Let Flintstones be Flintstones. Yes. 
Let those in Washington or Wisconsin let them be them. Let them be them. That's, that's if they want to pass community. out cookies, let them pass out cookies. If they want to heal with their local police department, yeah. But what's happened is you have these people like this, like you just said, from multiple sides that yeah. are using that platform. Those groups come because they seek violence. Exactly. And then that gets that gets left on on the community to deal with. Kyle wasn't from there. Uh, when you hear the report of the number of people who were arrested that night, the majority of them were outsiders, whether Antifa or Black Lives Matter. The, the people who were being arrested were all outsiders. And so now the community is like, what is going on? We are, we're not like this. And so then you start to wonder, well, yeah. where did all of these people yeah. come from? People who are saying, Kyle, like, he's definitely not from here. We've never seen this guy around, not in our schools, yeah. not anything. But he came here in our community and and shot someone. And it's just unfortunate because when you hop on social media, you'll you'll see the great divide right in front of you. People that are saying, yes, he's a hero, he's a patriot, that's awesome that he did that. And then you have the people like myself that are like, wait, human life is lost now. Does that not affect anyone? Have we become that desensitized that we just don't care? So, so we talked about something that we just said called for what? What was the value of it? So total side note, we had a, a, an incident where one of our young officers was involved in a chase and that chase was a misdemeanor. And that officer tipped over 100 miles an hour in four minutes from start to finish. He wasn't involved in anything after that. He just just got involved with that section of, of, of uh, what I call policy violation. In the end, his involvement had nothing to do with how that, ended yeah but my question to him when i sat down with him i said was it worth it like if in that four minutes you killed somebody you rolled your vehicle you blew out a wheel and i go to your wife and your babies and i say daddy's dead because he went 106 miles an hour to chase somebody for a misdemeanor right is that worth it like we literally have to start asking ourselves by my actions and the potential consequences is it worth is it? Is it worth it? That's so good. I, I I think that is actually the question that people should be asking about everything that transpired that night. Was it worth it? Was it worth now the lives lost over property that insurance will, will cover? For now the 17-year-old boy who, even if he's hailed as a hero, mentally... He's torn apart. I don't see how someone can just kill someone and just walk away from it and say, well, that's what I did. No way. You're going to have nightmares. You're going to be screwed up in the head for having having to do something like that. And that's even why, like when I think about when I was in that alley and I use the term eliminate the threat, why I know that had I have done that, I don't even know if I'd be able to sit here across from you right now. Like how screwed up in the head would I be? if I knew that I had to shot, shoot into a car, even in an incident like that. Good thing I wasn't armed and didn't because now he yeah. was arrested, he was charged. Why? Because I let law enforcement do their job. I didn't try to be a hero as a yeah. What I got to do as a hero was what I spoke about in that episode, which was helping the people on the ground who needed the help. It's kind of like, and that's only this profession. Imagine somebody who, uh, you know, is uh, having a stroke mm-hmm. and you're like, there is not a neurosurgeon here. I saw this on YouTube. I'm going to do a <laughs> cerebral thrombectomy <laughs> no way. right now. Yeah. I mean, no. I'm going to do it. Like not you wouldn't even happen. think about that not stuff. And, and I say that because like you just said, there's a point where you got to, you got to know your limitations. Yeah. And in law enforcement, <laughs> I hate to say it, but there's a lot of people that want to be hobby cops. Yep. And that's why you can't take this profession lightly. Yeah. And, and, and we are in a world where we are so critiqued and we are so on the front lines of every action we do more than ever before that those that don't have that experience, that training, not even that, but even the maturity, like we talked about it, 17 years old, yeah. you just got your license less than a year ago. Exactly. Yeah. So. And, and, and aside from all that, it distracted from what really happened that triggered this whole thing. Totally, totally. Because now the country is actually talking more about the Kyle Rittenhouse situation than the Jacob Blake, and that's that's so true. What was uh, Jacob's family like? And did you talk to any cops from uh, Kenosha? Um, I, I only spoke to some of the National Guard um, officers that, that were there, and um, I, I feel like they all felt the sense of calm and that everything was going to be all right by that point too. Um, I didn't have a chance to speak to the father, but I heard the message that he delivered. How much violence did he promote? 
None. Exactly. None. Not as the father. I didn't hear the sister talk that way. The mother didn't talk. The father actually asked at that protest. He said, please, please, can we make sure there is no violence tonight? Come Let's on. show everyone that we're better than that. So there was that. And then there was a part that he said that really touched my heart as a father because you know there's always that talk about in the black community that our fathers are absent and everything else now here's a, a young man who was shot and his father was there and something that he said from the stage that day he said when I went to go and see my son in the hospital and I was holding my son's hand and he said my son said to me um, dad why did they shoot me so many times and he said my response to my son was son they weren't supposed to have shot you at all and and that really hurt just knowing that here's a father who is reminding his son that who is now paralyzed that this shouldn't have happened at all. And I think there's also that next step to that, which is with our parenting also comes like we always talk about the talk in the black community, right? The way that we raise up, especially our black sons, how to interact with with law, law enforcement, enforcement, right? You would assume that like which is completely foreign to white people. I'm telling you, I've never had a talk with my two boys. Listen, guys, when you get pulled over by a black police officer, there may be an opportunity where they kill you. Like you, we got to know when you, I've never had that talk. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, I don't care who pulls you over. Make sure you're respectful. Make sure you let them know if for some reason they need something you explain. I mean, yeah. my talk and your talk to your it's kids totally, totally different. different. Yeah. My talk is here's how you can survive and make Jeez, it home to me. That's, that, that blows my Just mind. Just to live another day. Right. And so I'm sure that's going through that father's head in that moment was son, where did you miss all of the teachings yeah. about how we interact with, with law police. enforcement to make sure That's that right. it doesn't escalate Because if that would have happened, yeah, you, you know, wouldn't, we have wouldn't this. see any of this, right? Because and and that's the thing. And and I'm not I'm not one yeah. of those who who is saying um, comply and don't die and all of that because I see that in the comments all yeah. the time. But I do think there are all of these steps that we all miss along yeah. the way. The individual the law enforcement officers, That's right. the protesters, everyone has a responsibility and we all miss those things. And then we watch total chaos ensue yep. and we start pointing fingers at who is at fault. And, and I think for me, as someone who just loves humanity, someone who just loves human life, I'm like, can we all just take a step back and use these as teaching moments for all of us? For me, to my children, to my community, to the students and the young people that I talk to, to you all as law enforcement to say, hey, let's look at this situation yeah. as a learning yeah. moment. How do we correct the yeah. wrong from it and how do we learn from this to make sure that next week there won't be another one? Right. Because there will be, sadly, right? Next week there's probably going to be another one. And and same with the protests, right? Because right after the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting, the next day in Portland. Los Angeles. Ne no, in Portland. Someone shot a... Um, uh, a, a, supporter. a Trump supporter. I know. In L.A. too. L.A. as well. Yes. Right? And so so that's where we are as a country. But you can't protest every shooting for the rest of the uh, our eternity. No way. Something's got to give. We have to change. My gosh. We, we have to change. And, and you know what? Listen, I got to be honest here. Not every white on black police shooting is a bad shooting. Right. And not every black on white shooting is a bad shooting or white on white or black on black. Right. You have to take them. That is the ultimate level of... Of, of deadly force. I mean, there's no other profession on the planet yeah. that has the ability to make a personal decision to take someone's life. Even in the military, yes. they have to get orders. There's rules of engagement. Totally. But in law enforcement, it's a standing order. And that's why I said mental footnote on eliminate the threat. You and I have to have different rules, so to speak. As yeah. a civilian or as a police officer, you have a different threat level than I do. Absolutely. And I have the burden of justifying my actions based on the threat level because I have all these tools that can take people's freedom or take their life. Yes. You don't have that same responsibility. So when I say that the burden of what we're doing falls on police, I appreciate you accepting responsibility as a black man to teach black men and women how to interact with police. Totally. But on the flip side, I can't come into shift work with a chip on my shoulder or a preconceived racist mentality because I was taught that way or maybe I had a bad interaction with somebody of color two weeks ago right. and now I'm looking at you. Like both of these have to change like never before in history. So I'm going to ask you and I'm going to give you my perspective. 
what message do we and how do we give it to people interacting with police so it doesn't cause the officers to accelerate that threat level? Absolutely. What 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 is that lesson? And yeah. then I'm gonna teach and it's talked about what we need to do with police. Yes. So I, I think for me, um, what I what I try and teach, not only to my children, but to people in, in the black community and students that I'm talking to, I always let people know, no matter what type of um, wrong that you felt you were experiencing during that traffic stop or during that interaction with the police, your most important thing is to make sure that you get to live another day to go and file that report with the police department, the sheriff, and everyone else. But by you escalating the situation or or going to reach for something, all of these things that can be triggers to now cause what society would see as a justified shooting, just live another day. And so, you know, I I hate to use the term like just comply. Sometimes that just means just be respectful. You know, Mm -hmm. like for me, when I'm when I'm at it, it, I got pulled over what just a few weeks ago. And he asked for my driver's license and registration. And I was like, um, I kept my hands on the steering wheel and I said, my um, my registration is in my glove box. Do you mind if I reach for it? I would have done the same thing. Totally, right? Yeah. So, so th- that is not a yep. difficult ask for people yep. in, in my community who know that we're already afraid, right? But so is that officer. Yes. And so we have to make sure that yep. we reduce the tension on both sides. I'm nervous because I've seen enough videos of people like me, like, getting shot in this altercation, right? But I also have to remember the millions of stops that happen during that same year yeah. that end super positive, yeah. right? And so it ended with myself and that officer just joking around at the end of the uh, at the end of that traffic stop because simply I did everything that I can to reduce the tension for me, so yeah. I'm not nervous, but also for him. And so it's not even necessarily comply and don't die. It's like, let's just be mindful of the interactions that we have with, with one another. Let's be respectful, not even just when it comes to police, but just with the human beings that we interact with in general. And the more that we can start to learn that, we're not gonna continue to see these type of outcomes. you know. And, and it's just, it's really unfortunate that that's where we are as a nation, where people are justifying murder because they're saying, well, you shouldn't have been rude. He shouldn't have threw something in that direction. Shouldn't have disrespected me. Shouldn't have disrespected that person. Now you're dead. Wait, whoa. That is a life gone. It goes back to, was it worth it? Was it worth it? It, it, it never is, right? And so, so and, and, and one, I, I, I want to hear your response on that as well. And I know we're running short no, go ahead. Uh, for time on this episode. But the, the main question that I asked in that video um, that I had put out is, at what point does it become... Uh, use of force for seven shots versus one or two shots like where or how is that determined right because I wonder that with the Jacob Blake situation could it have been and, and we've used the term eliminate the threat could one shot two shots have eliminated the threat if there was the concern that he was reaching for a weapon in the car or how does the training work in that situation to make it reach seven shots? I think people get focused on the number of shots to describe the brutality of the incident, and I get that. Yeah. But I will tell you whether he got shot seven times in the back, three times in the back, or twice in the back, Still it doesn't change. Them. So as far as law enforcement, we are taught when it comes to deadly force, it is to stop the threat. Eliminate. Yep. We we shoot multiple times because you have people that could be wearing body armor, people that could be on uh, psychotropic medications, uh, drugs, people that don't have a fatal wound from it. I mean, we shoot to eliminate and sometimes cause death. Yeah. The number of shots, if you have two or three officers, it is common that our training is to shoot two to three times, bam, 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 reassess, bam, 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 reassess. Wow. That's nine times if three cops are there. Yeah. Because they're seeing three different things at the same time, but you see cops shoot nine times. So I would want to make sure people don't get focused on the number of shots fired yes. or the number of shots on target because if you take away the controversial shootings, 
if this individual is truly there and has killed people and is about to kill other people, the average person would say, please stop that threat. Absolutely. And if it takes two shots or four shots, stop that threat. Yeah. So our training is that force continuum. And that's why the ultimate, the ultimate training is deadly force. And we shoot more than we do emergency driving. We shoot more than we do report writing because the shoot don't shoot scenario is what's going to put us on the front page. What we also teach now more than ever before, and which I'm a huge proponent of, and as my platform grows, so does my mission, and that is to do standardized training and expectations across the country of what de-escalation looks like Completely. and what fatal force at that time is supposed to be. Yeah. Because it's so subjective that it starts to create problems all over because my definition of fatal force and yours can be completely different wow. based on the region of where we are. Wow. Something that you said. They're in, giving in us your, the fingers. They're giving us the five <laughs> but, but, fingers. But there's probably other parts we can edit out because it. now this is getting good, right? So, so <laughs> there's so something that you said in there that I've like never even heard anyone say it in in that way, is that the the number of shots is sometimes dependent on like if that person is on drugs, if they are wearing body armor. A lot of people don't think about That's it right. like that because we've all seen the videos when we were younger of what people who are on PCP are capable of right. doing when they're on PCP. And and I don't think we, we really think about that in that moment that on PCP, a couple of shots, you can still reach in Hands your car down. and grab a gun and turn around and start shooting people. You know, and I, I think for me, when I first saw the video, again, I'm always thinking as a father, and I'm like three babies in the back seat, three little boys. Did it have to yeah. be that way, right? But we always have to ask, well, what did the officers hear from dispatch that they were even responding to? Mm-hmm. Who was this this person, right? And, and I don't think there is enough of that backtracking yeah. that we do to wonder, like, how heightened is this situation even just upon arrival? I know. Like, who are we facing, right? And, and I don't think we, we think about that enough. And again, I don't think either of us are, are justifying this in, in any sort of way, but for people to just pay attention to all of these different scenarios before passing judgment. Because even I, who is very familiar with a lot of these things, I was not taking into account this person could have been on something. This person could have had on body armor, right? And and so we don't we don't often think about that. And it's and people don't realize how easy it is to have on body armor, right? Like my backpack is bulletproof. There you go. I keep a bulletproof uh, uh vest. There's one in my trunk right now in the Same. rental car that I had taken with me when I was out in um in Kenosha because I didn't know how tense things may have gotten that night. And so sometimes we don't think about that. Hmm. If I'm wearing a jacket or an overcoat, you don't even know that I have on a vest. And so you could probably shoot me and I can still survive that and, and yeah. shoot back. And and I don't think people always take that into account. And, and so I think it is important that before we, we rush to judgment, whether it be on the Jacob Blake video that we saw or the Kyle Rittenhouse video that we saw, even though people are probably going to say, well, you already passed judgment by saying he was 17. I stand by that. I stand by my stance on the fact that a 17-year-old kid shouldn't have been there, period. And if I lose fans because of that, and if people say, you know, I, I used to like you, but now your message is starting to get political. Hey, let me just say this. A 17-year-old has no business being a cop. <laughs> period. Period. Right? Right. Exactly. And yeah. so so I, I stand by that, yeah. and and I, I'm sure I'm going to lose fans because of it, but that's that's fine. I know where I stand as, as a father, and I know who I was at 17. I was a knucklehead track athlete at 17 yeah. years old. I was a senior in high school. You know, and, that same age maturity thing happens when it comes to police because of those three cops that wore the same uniform, one had seven years, one had over a little over two years, mm-hmm. and one's been there since January. Wow. So, I mean, you take even the maturity of the police there. Yep. I mean, all those have different levels of, of ability, so Absolutely. to speak. Absolutely, and experiences. Experiences. That, that they've been through. Yeah. I know that a lot of the things that I've gone through as a man yeah. completely changed the way I respond to That's situations. Right. I, I think, think back about the time as a police officer, I became a cop when I was 21 years old. Yep. Hired at the sheriff's office at 18, seasonal, 20 in the jail, 21 in the police. And I'm thinking, man, I, I pulled over cars at 21 years old. I looked at like my boy who's going to be 22, but like when... 
I was doing those things. I'm thinking, how did I survive? Yeah. Like I didn't even have life experience. Right. I didn't do any of that stuff. Yeah. It was a tragedy all around. I just want to give great credit to the community. It is so refreshing to hear yes. that those from Kenosha, Wisconsin, yes. that were serving and helping and trying to heal the nation before others came in and agitated. Man, yeah. I, I am proud of that community. Completely. I can answer my part of it. So your message is to the young black, young white folks is that is to um, respect, comply, uh, communicate, yeah. it, it, and don't escalate it ourselves. Completely. Mine would be, for all my cops out there, it is not us against them. You cannot have, we are among the community, and at the same time, the burden of tactical decision-making falls on us. Absolutely. Otherwise, get out of this field. And that means that we have the burden of making good decisions, especially as things de-escalate, where it could cause you to engage physically before you have to kill somebody for something that when we sit down after it's done and ask, was it worth was it? it? The worth answer it? is no. Yeah. So in our training now, as training evolves, we have to over burden ourselves with the what I call the rules of engagement that we don't have to justify a shooting because it's iffy. Justify shooting because it was justified. Yes. And then you have nothing to worry about. Yeah, no so question. this perception business that's been out there, yeah. don't shoot somebody if you think they have a gun, but they don't, and it's a cell phone. Don't, and, and, and even with a knife, you know, I mean, I could. I, there's cops that have been sliced up and killed and stabbed with knives. Yes. I get that. We just had an officer two weeks ago get stabbed with a knife, wow. cut his wrist wow. from a mentally disabled. He backed away instead of shooting in the door. Yeah. And then we ended up getting them just a few minutes later. I mean, those situations. So the key is to master your training. But I'm telling you, Ken, the bigger message that I see in these cities is a breakdown between civil government officials and the law enforcement community, yeah. whether it's New York or Portland or Seattle, there's a breakdown where mayors and councils do not support law enforcement. Mm. And when you work in lockstep together, it works and the community sees it. But what, is the, what does the Bible say? A divided house will never yeah. stand. Yeah. Does the Bible say that or is that Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> Probably both. I know. Good answer. <laughs> right. But what's happened is this crazy division and now you have cops wondering, I'm not even going to be backed. Yeah. And then you have government saying, I don't want that. And it creates that rift. So bottom line is we are a show about healing. We're a show about talking real talk. And we're not here to build fans. Yeah, we're absolutely. here to speak truth. That's it. And everything's on the table. That's it. I, I think... Um Again, I, I hope they're that so people mad at us right now. This. Oh, about the episode? No, oh, we can yeah. edit stuff. No, we're good. Um, I, I think, I, and I hope that people that that listen to this will really listen to it with with an open heart yeah. and try to understand where where we're coming from with this. Again, we're not passing judgment on on anyone, but we are saying that was it worth it? Yeah. Right. Like I love the way you put it. Was it was it worth it? Now lives are lost. Yeah. And I just, I don't think it was worth it, you know, so. So that is your challenge today. Ken and I always end a show with a one minute overview. So I'm going to pass it to him as our pilot show who came up with this title. I'm giving him first dibs. Um, if you have to put everything in perspective based on what we talked about at a pilot show, yes. what is the 60 second lesson for our viewers and listeners? 60 second lesson uh, for our viewers and listeners. One, when we see these videos on social media, let's try our best not to pass judgment because we are already making up people's minds for them when we share it and say, hey, did you see this? I'm so fed up with this. I can't believe this is happening happening so you're already watching it in a certain posture to say oh yeah and then now all of a sudden we've got this uh, uh, echo chamber that we've created where we're all saying the same thing when if we can all step back and say hey I saw it but let's wait for more of the facts and things to come out before we pass judgment on on this situation and I think even for myself my knee-jerk reaction even when I saw the Kyle Rittenhouse video um, I had to take a step back and say wait did any of this need to happen and and so I think before any of us rush to judgment, let's just look at the whole picture. Um, and if you're some of those who say, I don't even want to watch that stuff, then please don't. <laughs> you know, we don't all have to be right. involved in this conversation. I always say you don't have to show up to every fight that you're invited to. Yeah. And and I think so many times yeah. people see things across their social media and they say, I'm supposed to comment on. The no, you don't. You can yeah. actually just 
scroll That's right it. on by, you know. But if you want to have a, a heart to heart, and I think that this is so powerful, people from two completely different walks of life who can say, you know what, let's put it on the table and let's discuss it. And I hope that people will pay attention to that. That's probably more than 60 seconds, but it's all good. It's all good, man. <laughs> so, all right, how about you? 60 seconds or more <laughs> of what your thoughts are. Number one, let communities heal their own communities. Love that. I don't need somebody else's family member to come into my family and take care of my business. Number two, is it worth it? Yeah. Not only in law enforcement, but in every aspect of your life, if you're about to venture into something that you know has fatal consequences, either by life or by your family or by your career, then if what you're doing is worth it, keep going. But in the end, if what you're doing is not worth it, let it go. Let it go. Yeah. That's my lesson. Awesome. Hey, congratulations on pilot number one. Yes. We appreciate you. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, send in comments, go to blackandbluepodcast.com, and we want you to be a part of this conversation. Ken and I are committed not to build fans, but bring truth. Absolutely. We'll see you next time. Love it.